This morning, I would like to focus on an aspect of the Transfiguration story that is often taken for granted. It's setting. Peter, James, and John are about to have an experience that they would not soon forget. They will witness Jesus being transfigured before them. Not only will Jesus' face become bright, his entire body will as well. Jesus will be revealed as the Son of God, an affirmation he heard at baptism. But now Peter, James, and John will see it from themselves on top of the mountain near Caesarea Philippi. What I would like to suggest to you this morning is the role topography plays in transformation. Granted, it does not play the lead role as a character in a play, but its part is no less significant in building the stage for transformation to happen. For example, notice the role the mountain plays in both of our stories. Both Moses and Jesus go up to the mountain for guidance and direction. Moses is going up to receive the Ten Commandments. Moses is going up to encounter God. Likewise, Jesus is going up to encounter God. Did you know that the largest temple in Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization, was the ziggurat at Ur, with its stairs ascending to the heaven on all four sides, east, west, north, and south? Is this a coincidence? You know, it pays to put these in the right order. <laughs> or, does the temple of the, or does the top of the temple symbolize the top of the mountain to reveal new insights once the clouds roll away? This reminds me of the time I was with my family and my in-laws in the Lake District of England. We were there celebrating Catherine's 50th parents' 50th wedding anniversary. We hope to have a glorious week of sunshine to see the magnificent mountains of the Lake District. But what we got was a week of driving rain and fog. We didn't see any mountains. But this did not deter us one bit on our hikes and on our sightseeing trips and seeking out what could be seen through the driving rain and fog. I can remember wanting to go over a hard knot pass as our dachshund was named after this pass. We shortened it to naughty because we didn't think it sounded appropriate to say, come here, hard knot pass. We thought it would be better to say, come here, naughty. I won't tell you what kind of dog she was. I think the name says it. No, she was a saint compared to our other dachshunds. <laughs> On the way to Hard Knot Pass, we come to an old Roman fort. Our driver meant only to mention it as a point of reference. He had no idea we would want to stop and explore it in the driving rain. But we did. His last words were, be careful, you don't want to walk off the cliff exploring the fort. I think it was a blessing that we couldn't see where the cliff ended. We might not have explored the fort. The fog was so thick that you could cut it with a knife. I imagine that the cloud that covered Mount Sinai and the cloud that covered the Mount of Transfiguration was just as thick. Clouds, you may recall, in the Bible are often theophanies, which means they reveal the holy amidst the cloud. Ironically, it is a seeing which is not a seeing. The emphasis on what God says out of the cloud, not what one sees in spite of the cloud. In Exodus, God gives Moses the Ten Commandments in the Book of the Covenant. In Matthew, God speaks to Peter, James, and John and says, in effect, listen to my boy Jesus. 
And yet they become enraptured by what they see. Peter wants to build three booths in response to what he sees. But Jesus is not on the same par as Moses and Elijah. Granted, Jesus is a prophet like Moses and Elijah, but Jesus is more than a prophet as attested by Peter at Caesarea Philippi six days earlier when he said to Jesus, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds, Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but God in heaven. And now Peter hears the voice out of the clouds say, This is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. In other words, the voice out of the cloud is a corrective to what Peter has just witnessed and what he proposes to do, building three booths, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, puts all three on the same level of veneration and devotion, when in reality, Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets that bear witness to Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. Yes, mountaintop experiences can be an occasion for transformation. Uh, but one needs to be careful about the conclusions we draw about what it all means. I say this because all authentic encounters of the holy both reveal and conceal their true meaning. Only by paying attention to the setting, to the people, to the places, can we hear the voice that speaks to the depths of our being? Only then can we hear the voice out of the cloud of a knowing. By the way, there was a spiritual classic by that title, The Cloud of the Unknowing. Listen to how this anonymous author of medieval literature describes. For when you first begin to undertake it, all you find is darkness, a sort of cloud of unknowing. You cannot tell what it is except that you experience it in your will, a simple reaching out to God. This darkness and cloud is always between you and your God, no matter what you do, and it prevents you from seeing him clearly by the light of understanding and from experiencing him in the sweetness of your affection. So set yourself to rest in this darkness as long as you can, always crying out after him. For if you are to experience him or to see him at all, in so far as it is possible here, it must always be in this cloud and in this darkness. Another writer who has written extensively on the spiritual life is Kathleen Norris. Kathleen has written a wonderful book entitled Dakota, a Spiritual Geography. For Kathleen, her topography was not the mountains but the Great Plains as the cruciform into which her faith was transformed. On page 15, she writes, the silence of the plains, this great unpeopled landscape of earth and sky is much like the silence one finds in a monastery, an unfathomable silence that has the power to reform you. Kathleen and her husband would soon discover this as the as they left the hustle and bustle and vitality of the big city like New York City for the small town of Lemon or Lemon, South Dakota. Which is it? Is it Lemon or is it Lemon? I mean, I don't have anybody from South Dakota. I heard it said both ways, so that's the reason why I asked. Well, I'm gonna say Lemon, because we would say that in the South. From the small town of Lemon, South Dakota, to live in the house of her grandmother. She and her husband were writers, but could they write in the place where everybody is from if given the chance to leave? 
Kathleen found herself in the desert just as the Israelites found themselves wandering in the desert for 40 years. This reminds me of two jokes that I've got to tell you. Do you know why Moses and the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years before entering the promised land? Isn't it just like a man not to stop and ask for directions when lost? Or maybe his iPhone was set to the promised land, but once it got into the desert, out of reach of the cell towers, Siri kept on saying, recalculating, recalculating. Recalculating. Despite being in the desert, Kathleen discovered that her soul needed the expanse of the big sky and the deprivations of the big city to find her voice and her true home, just like a des desert cactus that comes to life whenever it rains. This should not surprise us as Jesus found his true calling in the desert. This calling as the long-awaited Messiah would not be on the devil's terms or anyone else's terms for that matter. Only God the Father could dictate how Jesus would fulfill his calling as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Listen to how Jesus rebuked the devil when he said, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And these words, it is written, worship and serve him only. Armed with this insight in the word of God, Jesus was ready to venture forth to fulfill his God-given destiny. Can we be content to be no more and no less a beloved son or a beloved daughter as we live out our divine calling in life? Kathleen Norris discovered it to be a writer on the spiritual life in the plains of the Dakotas. She knows that the cell of the Dakotas can be too restrictive for many, but if you can brace the people on the place to listen deeply to the voice that addresses you, it can be the cruciform of your transformation. Listen to the wisdom of Kathleen Norris again as she writes, whether the desert is a monastery, a one room schoolhouse 40 miles from the nearest town, where the children are telling you that poetry's dumb or a cinder block motel room whose windows rattle in the fierce winter winds, a healthy ascetic discipline asks you to rejoice in these gifts of deprivation, to learn from them, and to care less for amenities than that which refreshes from a deeper source. Desert wisdom allows you to be at home, wherever you are. A brother came to Cetus, Egypt, to visit Abba Moses and asked him for a word. The old man said to him, go sit in your cell, and your cell will teach you everything. Listen deeply to the people and the places you find yourself in, whether it be the desert, the mountains, or the Great Plains, or right here in Wichita, Kansas. These people and this place can be the cruciform of your transformation. It is, as Kathleen Norris has said, everybody seems to be from the Dakotas because we find the cruciform of the setting too harsh. But the path to glory does not bypass the cross. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die. He knows it. And he's trying to get his disciples to accept this as well. For something to be born in us, something must first die in us. 
The transformation of the caterpillar into the butterfly does not happen unless the caterpillar lies in the cocoon of the tomb. Jesus was laid in the tomb on Good Friday and was raised to new life on Easter Sunday. Death becomes the resurrection in the cruciform of the tomb. Ash Wednesday begins the Lenten journey to Jerusalem to die with Christ that we might be raised with Christ. But for now, on this day, we are on the mountain with Jesus, on the Mount of Transfiguration, having seen Jesus in his glorified state, a sight that we will not see again until the resurrection. But between these two mountaintop experiences stands the valley of human need and suffering that cries out for attention and deliverance. As much as we would want to hold on to these experiences, thinking the Christian life is one perpetual high after another, mountaintop experiences are for guidance and direction, for insight and inspiration, to be used as we roll up our sleeves, ministering to human need below, perspiring in the glow of being in the center of God's will, having heard the voice say, listen to him, and Jesus say, follow me. And we did. And our life has never been the same. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.